So uh, I think we can uh, draw some conclusions now. And uh, what we are doing some conclusions so that a normative basis of somatosensory evoked field under median nerve simulation is being created and we will continue to increase our uh, number of uh, normal subjects, especially focusing on the left hand persons. It seems that in Italy there are very few left hand people. And uh, another point is that Somatosensory evoked field analysis on patients recovering from strokes shows some quantifiable deficiencies. So I can give some numbers of what is going on. I can quantify something and I can say uh, the cortical activity is somewhere in one place and it's not on the other. Some uh, numbers with errors and I can say this is within, this is without my error. So least, uh, last, uh, the, this method may be used for follow-up during recovery period and to identify possible plasticity phenomena. Of course, since these are preliminary data, we don't have any follow-up of uh, patients. We will, of course, do this to see if there is any displacement in the source or any change in the pattern. This is the most important point, actually. And uh, I hope we will find some interesting things. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Pizzola. The paper is open for discussion. Uh, Can I use the mic? Yes, please. <coughs> uh, if I understood correctly what uh, Dr. Peresson presented before, you are using a 3.3 hertz as a stimulus rate. Right. Well, actually, we're using uh, f about 4.5. 4 uh, 4.5. Well, if you, like. if you should uh, use uh, some 3 hertz uh, for stimulus rate, you could make profit of uh, a much longer uh, time window within which you may uh, even record what it is called, at least for the electric, uh, somatosensory median nerve potentials, the N140, which seems to be very which is, not seems to be, but it is very stable and repetitive. I have just one slide here, if I'm allowed to. Uh, yeah. Sorry. Just to, hmm? Yes, uh, you see the, the time scale. Has, uh, is not necessary, thank you. Uh, knows very well that it is much stable, Sta much stable than uh, the other uh, peaks. But in any case, uh, I think that uh, since these potentials are uh, interesting also for uh, uh, the, the source problem, because uh, if you look at the fields produced at middle and long latency uh, from the somatosensory evolved responses, they are challenging because uh, most probably much more than one single region is contributed, contributing at those latency. This is one point. The other point is that if you are studying the plasticity or follow-up patients, also these uh, other uh, components should be included because the cost will be zero. Much of the time uh, is uh, spent in recording, then you may uh, process your data uh, offline and uh, the more data you get, uh, the, the, yeah, the higher <laughs> the outcome. 
uh, it's not a question, but just uh, suggest it. Yeah, of course, uh, it's a good idea to, well, we were trying to keep anyway uh, the session time short, and uh, when you start recording a number of, uh, say, 20, 22 trials, uh, it helps to, to have a higher repetition rate, and actually, we were interesting uh, mainly in the, this component, which is the first cortical one, is not affected by anything other than the cortex functioning. So we, we, were, we tried to push this as high as possible. We were also interested in having a good baseline uh, to evaluate, properly evaluate the amplitude of the component. And we <laughs> decided to, to go at that frequency, I mean, of course. Uh, uh, also, we uh, are just performing uh, uh, electric measurements with two electrodes here, just to check. Uh, but uh, we we are not using those data for analysis right now. We will maybe we will do it in the future. Thank you for your nice presentation. Uh, I'd like to ask you a couple of questions. Are you allowed to compare normative data of young persons to patients who are 60 or 70 and older? And wouldn't it be very easy just to compare the patients one side to the other and not compare the data of the young person yeah. with the late Yes, person? well, I mean, yeah, I, I... Okay, I have another uh, answer. For well, uh, yes, actually, this is also another thing we're doing. Maybe I, I didn't point this out very well. Uh, and anyway, in our normative basis, we have uh, also uh, three persons uh, over 50, and we have a 65 years old man. And uh, this is the challenge in finding normal subjects, not a 20 years old man, but uh, 65. And uh, anyway, uh, I feel it's important to have a normative basis anyway with uh, old peers. For the patients, it is interesting that your data are in accordance with those of uh, Vredeveld and Franse in, in uh, Holland. So Vredeveld wrote a thesis on the SAP and stroke, and he showed the same thing as you. If, if the stroke uh, is such that the SAP is gone, and you, so you don't see it anymore, and the maps are in the, the waves, if, the, if the, uh, the stroke is there and you see the SAP, you might see the patient recover, so that might be uh, something to, to look into also in your data. Mm -hmm. in, in yeah. And another thing is that what I saw often myself, and that's again the, the let's say the repetitive uh, discussion, the radial dipole is sometimes preserved. The tangential dipole is gone, and you see sometimes a radial dipole which is displaced to the back or the front. Did you measure that some? sometimes with your electric uh, electrodes? Um, well, um, yeah, of course, uh, to, to have both uh, complete uh, electric mapping and magnetic mapping will be nice. Um, anyway, uh, the, this uh, data taken from the N20 component um, with uh, low uh, intensity simulations we, we picked up after also after <laughs> Dr. Persson's study. Um, I think uh, we don't have uh, much radial component coming out. Uh, of course, since we would like to s look at for plasticity, we, yeah, it's uh, be nice to have uh, both. And uh, um, well, uh, right now we don't have the instrument to do this, but I hope we will have soon, a few months. Yes. You were recording. <coughs> I have a question. You were recording at uh, nine different electrode positions. Yes. Yes, uh, about ninety uh, scalp sites. They are magnetic nine, recordings. Nine. Nine. Yeah. Nine. We have a, we have a nine-channel system yeah. measuring uh, the field in nine different sites of the scalp. Then we move the sensor. Yeah. On the head. Yeah. So eight, nine, ten times. So we have. Uh, 70, 80, 90 uh, different scalp sites where, where we know the field and we map after okay. this. Okay, then 
I don't have a question. <laughs> Thank you. Can I put two questions, please? Yeah. As far as I understood, you can study the plasticity of the nervous system after a stroke. Well, uh, I mean by that the cases who well uh, who did well after a few months and some others we did not. Did you find any difference um, between the ages? Because we know that even old people can uh, have a kind of plasticity. I mean over 60 or over 70 or sometimes over 80. And uh, did, that is my first question. Is any kind of uh, difference, morphological difference or functional difference? And the second question is uh, why in some cases people who don't do well and why in other cases they do? Is any anatomical lesions, any functional lesions, or the magnetic fields permit you to study all these clinical questions we have every day? Well, uh, the, the first uh, question, uh, um, uh, actually we don't have normal subjects uh, at uh, over 80 years old, so I don't know really um, what uh, what to say about old uh, normal old people, but uh, in the patients we had uh, measured, the normal side was within normal limits. Taken these normal limits uh, uh, in the having uh, also young and uh, middle aged uh, people say an average of uh, probably 40 years old so uh, is uh, there is no evidence with this preliminary data of course of uh, source displacement in normal old people and uh, the second part um, you were Well, yes, uh, when uh, we, we had patients with uh, uh, a very, very severe ischemic uh, problem uh, with uh, cerebral uh, damage, we, we, we saw the maps uh, completely different. So there was no source at being active. Well, they were uh, all. They had uh, all of them had uh, an occlusion of the the cerebral art, the middle cerebral artery, uh, more severe or or not. But uh, the the disease was the same, the starting disease. Then, of course, some had different stories, but. Uh, there was a, a real damage of the brain, not only function. I would like just to, to add a little comment uh, to two previous questions. Uh, one is uh, um, for Hans Hamburger. Uh, the, one should take into account that um, the facility, the shielded room, is located inside a physics laboratory, which is not so a hospital environment yet, fortunately. So uh, these patients uh, are selected uh, after a complete examination made by Paolo Rossini, Professor Rossini, at a hospital, and they undergo uh, brain mapping, potential mapping there. We don't show this kind of data because uh, they are not simultaneous, and we uh, want only to compare simultaneously recorded data inside the shield room. But they have uh, already been studied uh, previously, okay, and so uh, 
we had that kind of information, but it's a separate information. Uh, and then, of course, they come to the, the shield room and uh, they, they make this kind of study, which is still a little bit too long, of course, because uh, two uh, whole hours for the complete preparation of subjects, uh, we use a, um, the magnetization, then we, for the moment, we still use a, a cap uh, which is uh, um, worn, worn by the, uh, the subject. So it takes, uh, say, half an hour, electron positioning, half an hour, 45 minutes, and then about one hour for complete recording inside the, the, the room, the shield room. So it's still a little bit too long. We hope to, to improve this uh, um, significantly with the new uh, 28 channel, which is uh, almost ready now. And the second question concerns, uh, the second comment concerns uh, uh, Federiano Grandori's question. And actually, we uh, um, record <coughs> at uh, uh, that rate, uh, as uh, Vittorio Pizzella explained, because uh, for that kind of, uh, <coughs> of study, uh, Paolo Rossini suggested to uh, use that repetition rate because the, the significance of the uh, study would not be affected. But uh, we, uh, of course, uh, um, bake up all the original data. And uh, since we use uh, a repetition rate of uh, 3 hertz or 4 hertz, we have uh, the total period of 300 milliseconds or 250 milliseconds. Only 100 milliseconds is shown there. But of course, we also have the possibility of investigating the yeah, other sorry, components. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, of course, you for, forgot mentioning. <clears throat> of course, for the moment, we have concentrated the analysis on these early components, also because we have also observed uh, uh, three or four years ago that uh, uh, you know, already the 45 um, millisecond latency component uh, already uh, contains uh, uh, a processing of data of the signal. So it's something more, uh, uh, more toward the associative functions uh, with respect to the 20. So th that's why we, for the moment, uh, focus our attention on the N20 only. a purely technical question to you. <laughs> why do you, s if you look at 20 milliseconds, why do you sample for such a long time? I mean, why do you, why do you do such a... Well, uh, I, I mean, the sampling rate is up to three or 400 milliseconds. Yes, 400. We, we, we actually take all the data. Uh, we have <coughs> a, a computer, a large enough computer to, to store everything. And uh, of course, to, to show you, it's better to uh, take only the first part uh, to, to clearly see the M20. It's just uh, we can afford that, so we can do it. Oh, and that's very important because if in a brainstorming like this, it suggests the messages that come out. We can take, we can take all the data. So, yeah. Yeah. I had the impression that over the right hemisphere, your 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 source was a little bit more anterior than on the left side. Is yeah. that correct? Yes. And and can you tell me is that is that the case in in how many subjects did you find that? Uh, I think uh, all. Oh. Well, uh, but uh, let me see. Yeah. No, no. Yeah. I would say in all subjects, some uh, are more, some less, but... Uh it, it is an intriguing result, and, and there are then two questions. First of all, do you have uh, MRI uh, photos in which you can see that there is an anatomical difference between the two? And the reason why I'm interested in it is that in the redness potentials, we have done also a kind of, of, of study like this, but with, with EEG. And we have the impression that there is also a small difference in, in the sources of, of then the precental um, uh, components of the RP, and that is also on the right side a little bit more anterior than on the left side. It would be interesting to compare those. Yeah, we insist. Actually, we have uh, MRI pictures only of two of uh, these uh, subjects we have studied, and uh, so we have just this preliminary data. We don't. Uh, we have no systematic work of this, but uh, we are doing this, of course, and all the subjects will undergo MRI, and, uh, and we will check for cortical displacement. Thank you. 
Uh, my question and remark is just a methodological one. I am a little bit puzzled by the number of trials you need, uh, 450 or something like that. And on the other hand, by the very, very, very small number of normal subjects, nine on the uh, right-handers and uh, two uh, left-handers. But you mention the age of a patient as a possible uh, dependent, no, sorry, as a possible independent variable affecting the, the data. Uh, do you uh, plan to uh, have a larger, a yeah, much larger group of normals? Yes, yes, uh, we are Because continuing. age may affect the results, but maybe even in normals, the fact of having drugs or not and other variables like that, what variables would you control? Well, of course, this is an undergoing study. We are continuing doing uh, normal subjects. Uh, and uh, as I mentioned before, we also are looking for left-hand subjects, uh, old left-hand subjects, mainly. And um, anyway, we will continue to, to measure both normal and patients, and we will start do real follow-up of these patients, uh, having them coming back once uh, in a while. And uh, so, uh, of course, uh, w w we have a rather small number now, but uh, we will uh, do that. And uh, since, uh, since uh, the patients are mainly old people, we are trying to find old subjects and uh, but anyway we will uh, well if you have a large enough number you can uh, uh, control all your parameters age uh, handness uh, and uh, wh what you like uh, sex but uh, of course right now it's not so easy we uh, we are continuing doing this measurement and uh, as soon as we have some uh, new results, of course, uh, we will let those. And uh, the other part uh, about the number of averages, I, I don't understand that. Sorry, I, I mean, we, of course, uh, we have, uh, we average the um, number of trials to, uh, to see the signal, to have a good signal to noise ratio. These were uh, one minute epochs, so short period actually and uh, also since we are looking at the very early 20 millisecond component we don't think this is affected by uh, different brain conditions high level brain conditions like uh, sleep or whatever so why not to do it well, we have to move on a very last question please take the mic Thank you. It's not exactly a question, it's just a comment. Um, age matched normals do take a lot of time and effort to do. When we did 108 subjects, that was only in visuals. In order to get your patient population in, we had to do all sorts of incentives. Now, true, people do need to have normative studies. But we're always going to get difficulties with trying to get the right sort of patient population in who are going to reflect the sort of patient population later that you're going to be looking at. So the comment really is um, you're always going to find difficulties in trying to get the right type of person with the type of parameters that you want to control within your patient population. I think there's no way of escaping that. We're always going to find difficulties in that. Thank you. We have to move on. Thank you very much, uh, the uh, paper. Obviously, a stimulating paper. And the next one will be given by Dr. Jürgens uh, from Ulm about noise compensation methods for the study of slow event related fields.
that I worked in a quite different field until our group at the University of Ulm received this challenging instrument. It is an MEG system based on 28 magnetometer channels distributed in these oh, <laughs> distributed in these two duars which may be positioned independently from each other so as to cover a large area over the human's head. We are presently undertaking two lines of investigations. We are recording from epileptic patients and we are looking for the Bereitschaftsmagnetic field preceding hand, eye and lid movements. And the system here is embedded in a shielded room by Vakuumschmelze. And one of the disadvantages of commercially shielded rooms like this is that they are very vulnerable for a low frequency magnetic ambient noise. And on the next transparency, I would like to demonstrate you that low frequency noise, even after considerable averaging, may simulate already slow brain f uh, fields. Please remember that we have magnetometers and not radiometers.